I can get started? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Welcome to this um, Centaur's tutorial. Uh, my name is Meng Ni and I'm the project manager from FutureWay Technologies. Today I'm here with my, two of my colleagues and one of our partners from click, click to cloud They are um, Dr. Eng Xiong, um, Dr. Peng Du, and Rupo. And together we'll be delivering this um, Centaurus tutorial for you. Uh, Centaurus, which is a cloud native infrastructure project for a large scale distributed cloud. And here's the agenda for today. Um, I will first start off the tutorial with a high level overview of Centaurus. And um, Dr. Eng Xiong will dive deep into the Octos architecture. Octos is our cloud compute infrastructure in Centaurus. And follow up on that, um, Dr. Peng Du will be talking about the Mizar and the Centaurus Edge deep dive. And to wrap up, Rupal will be talking, sharing some of the community updates, the events that we have done, and what are our plan for next step and how you can be, get involved to be a part of the community. Now, without further ado, I will start off by giving a um, high level overview of our Centaurus project. So what is Centaurus? Centaurus is an open source platform for building a unified and scalable distributed cloud infrastructure. And um, Project Centaurus actually joined the Linux Foundation in December 2020. And it was a great milestone for us that I would like to share with you all. And um, Centaurus unified the orchestration, network provisioning, and management of cloud compute and networking resources at original scale. It's also an umbrella project where we host four other sub-projects, Arctos, which is our cloud compute sub-project, Misa, our cloud networking subproject, Fornex is our Centaurus Edge subproject, and Elnir is our um, AI platform subproject. Now, um, as cloud becomes the norm to run um, de and develop current and future applications, um, current cloud infrastructure has to continuously evolve to meet new challenges and requirements posed by this um, next generation um, applications such as AI, 5G, cloud gaming, federated later federated learning, AI, VR, and many more. And this, actu this new type of application is actually driving the traditional cloud infrastructure to a more distributed cloud infrastructure. So here, I would like to share with you some of the challenges that we see in today's um, cloud environment. The first challenges that I would like to talk about is being able to manage distributed cloud at a large scale. So when we move from a more centralized cloud infrastructure to distributed cloud, we need to manage distributed cloud at a very large scale. It's not just if you think about it, it's not just managing a few um, those, a super large data center. We also need to think about managed edge cluster that are smaller and at a remote location. And our cloud infrastructure has to ne actually need to be redesigned and optimized to manage constraint resources that are um, running at the edge side that are closer to customer and customer data. And similarly, we also need to be able to provision and manage cloud virtual networks such as um, VPC, um, subnet routing rule, security rule, and across data center and, man and many edge locations. And it's actually very challenging if you think about um, edge location that has different quality of network and different network bandwidth. And in addition, cloud infrastructure also needs to support more and more types of um, resources or workloads. And it would be really helpful for cloud providers to have a unified platform uh, unified infrastructure to manage multiple types of computing resources, such as VM, containers, serverless, and server. So, and it's proven to be very challenging to have a unified stack to manage all these um, work computing resources all together. And now the first challenge is that with distributed cloud, computing nodes are actually everywhere. It could be in a large regional data center or it could be a small remote locations. And where to run customer applications to achieve high Throughput, high performance, and low latency while still optimizing the resource utilization is important. So um, distributed cloud infrastructure need a global view of all resources, and we need to be very smart about where we allocate these resources to run multi-tenant applications to meet customers' needs. And lastly, as AI workloads becomes more dominant workloads for cloud and edge computing, we also need an we need to optimize the same infrastructure to manage and run AI and machine learning applications between edge nodes and cloud data centers. And resource scheduling also needs to be very smart on how we allocate GPU resources efficiently. Now, with all these um, challenges that I talk about in mind, I would like to give um, 
um, high-level um, description of each of the sub-projects that I briefly mentioned earlier. And the first project I would like to talk about is Arctos. Arctos is an open source project designed for large-scale cloud compute infrastructure. It's derived from Kubernetes with core design changes. And Arctos aims to be an open source solution to address key challenges from large-scale cloud. And some of the key features I would like to highlight are large scalability. And with Arctos, we actually can now support large-scale infrastructure class management of 50K nodes per cluster. And our eventual goal is actually to support 300K nodes in one single regional control plan. And the next um, feature is unified orchestration for VM and container. And in Arctos, a pod can either contain multiple containers or one VM, and they are scheduled the same way in the same resource pool. And this enable organization to this enable organization cloud providers to use a single converged stack to manage all cloud hosts. In the future, and we're also working to support other compute workloads such as um, serverless or bare metal server. And the third feature I would like to talk about is the hard building multi tenancy. So basically, external organization can share the same physical cluster without trust among this organization. And it's based on the virtual cluster idea, and all tenants will, all isolations are transparent to tenants, and each tenant feels like it's their own dedicated cluster for them. And in the following session, Dr. Ying Xiong will be talking more about the Octo, Octo's um, architecture. And next, I would like to talk about the MISAR, which is our networking sub-project under Centaurus. So the current flow-based programming solutions are no longer suitable for the high-scale multi-tenant networking environment. So we started building MISAR from ground up on top of um, XDP Express Datapath. And MISAR's main building block is actually an XDP program that runs on each host. And MISAR, by definition, is a large-scale and high-performance cloud network that does to run virtual machines, containers, and other compute workloads. And unlike traditional networking solutions, MISAR relies on the natural partitioning of a cloud network to scale. And MISAR also simplifies the programming of data plan to scale by flexible in-network processing, um, which is um, different compared to the flow-based pro programming model. And on the left here, we see the MISAR's high-level architecture, which includes the management plan and the data plan. So MISAR's data plan is actually built on XDP and eBPF um, technologies and Geneve network protocol. It provides high performance and extensible packet processing pipeline and function that helps to achieve MISA's functional scale and performance goal. And MISA's management plan, on the other hand, um, is built on top of Kubernetes using CRD and operator framework. And it programs the data plan by translating typ uh, typical networking APIs and uh, resources to MISA's specific configuration. And some of the key challenges, I'm um, sorry, key advantage of MISA is that um, it can support the management and provisioning of large scale of networking endpoints in one cluster without compromising the performance of the network. And MISAR also has high network throughput and low latency. MISAR has an extendable data plan and MISAR unifying the data plan for a VM container and potentially other compute workloads in the future. And MISAR also provides uh, multi-tenant isolation for traffic and address spaces. And also, you will hear more about the MISA architecture from um, Dr. Pengdu in shortly. And next up, I would like to introduce our Edge subproject to you. Um, Centaurus Edge, which is also called Fornex, provides a framework that allows user application to run reliably in the Edge environment. And following two of the design principles, robustness and flexible topology, I'm excited to introduce you to our, um, some of the key features from our first release, which was just launched last month. So the first um, key feature was that both computing nodes and cluster can now run on the edge. And um, CentOS Edge also has a hierarchical topology where edge um, cluster can be structured in multi-layer tree-like topology, providing the best mapping to end-user scenarios. And CentOS Edge also support multiple flavors of cluster on the edge, such as um, Kubernetes, lightweight Kubernetes, and um, Octos, our um, sub-project that I just talked about. And lastly, CentOS Edge provides multi-tenant edge cluster and networking, and it supports concepts like VPC and subnet. And also CentOS Edge also allows application deployed at different edge locations to communicate with each other through edge-to-edge -edge communication. And I just want to emphasize that edge computing is not just equal to running things in a local cluster, 
uh, local data center, but rather to offer a way for different components of application to run in their best suited environment in collected efforts. And more details on Edge will also be shared shortly. And lastly, I would like to introduce you to our um, AI platform subproject, which is called Elnair. So as AI workloads thrive on cloud, we're seeing rapid adoptions from many sectors such as um, healthcare, retail, auto, and many more. And according to Model Intelligent, the cloud AI market was valued at USD 5.2 billion in 2020 and expected to reach USD 13.1 billion by um, 2026, registering a compound annual growth rate of 20.3%. And we all understand that um, AI workloads have their special characteristics. Um, for example, long running, which requires full tolerance, distributed training and gradient exchange, which requires co-scheduling and communication, and burst ball request as serving, which requires low latency and um, low balancing. And with those characteristics in mind, we started the Elner project, which is positioned as a self-learning elastic platform for AI workloads. And in order for us to achieve this self-learning plus um, elastic platform, optimization is needed to improve resource utilization, training and serving efficiency, monitoring, logging, and the intelligence of the platform. And on this slide, you will see on the left is our high-level um, Elner architecture, which includes four components. The first one is the Unified Elastic Framework, which is an easy-to-use framework which unifies normal distributed training and elastic training. A multi-functional profiler, which does multi-level resource utilization monitoring. Um, AI-oriented scheduler, which is a learning-based scheduling strategy for um, that leverage real-time cluster status for dynamic GPU workload scheduling. And lastly, defined grain GPU sharing, which is to support um, fractional GPU resource allocation in order for us to improve resource utilization. And some of the uh, a few key highlights that I would like to emphasize is that profiling and monitoring provides the insights of how efficient cluster and job run. And it's actually the data foundation for us to build a self-learning system. And elastic training and dynamic scheduling with a global view of resource utilization in a cluster are essential for running AI training job efficiently. And lastly, GPU sharing is critical for improving resource utilization in the AI serving um, scenarios. And with the collected effort from the four components, Elnir is a platform designed to improve AI workload efficiency while equipped with the self-learning capabilities to continuously optimize the decision that were made by itself. And unfortunately, we don't have a deep dive on the Elnir architecture today, but you are welcome to join us, um, visit us on our GitHub page to learn more about the architecture of Elnir and also some of the work that we're doing and what are some of the next steps and how you can be a part of the community. And that um, concludes the um, high-level introduction to Centaurus. Next, I will hand it over to Dr. Ng Shun, who will be giving a deep dive on Octos, our cloud compute infrastructure in Centaurus. Thank you, Muni. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Yinxiong. I'm with Virtual Technologies. And I want to thank you again to come to this tutorial. Uh, we have prepared lots of slides, and uh, we have a lot of contents to uh, cover within an hour. So we're going to try our best to finish in the hour. So I'm going to uh, jump right into the topic and give a little bit dive of the project Arctos. So as Meng Li mentioned that the vision for Arctos is to become a large scale cloud native infrastructure that manage a cluster of computing nodes that provision the resource on demand for application and, and your workload. Now talking about the cloud native and orchestration platform, I know you will immediately think of the Kubernetes, which is the most successful, most popular and open source project. And in those days, in recent years, so what is Arctos? Well, Arctos is based on Kubernetes, as Mungli mentioned, but with a fundamental change that we made to achieve the goal we want for Arctos, which become the, ne the next generation cloud native infrastructure for the, uh, to manage the AI, and 5G, and all next generation applications. So here are four major changes that we made to the Kubernetes for Arctos, is the project itself. We first scale out the Kubernetes architecture to support large scale clusters. When I say large scale, 
we mean that more than 30,000 nodes in the cluster want to support. And as Mung Lee mentioned, we have a goal to support 100,000 uh, computing nodes in the clusters. I will show you how, we, how this is designed uh, later in the slides. We also made a fundamental change to the almost entire Kubernetes code base to provide the multi-tendency and network isolation to make it Kubernetes a true cloud native infrastructure that manage uh, the multi-tendency. So we sometimes we call it virtualized uh, Kubernetes. That means that the multiple customer or multiple tenant, they can share the same Kubernetes cluster without impacting each other. The third change that we made or introduced in Arctos is to unify the API and object and the runtime for both VM and uh, containers. We intend to support uh, future more virtualization such as bare matters, more type of resources, or other uh, new type of container or, or uh, virtualizations. So the first major change we made is to extend the architecture to support and manage the cluster that far away from cloud center, which is on the edge side. And Dupont will show how we do that and manage a work node that deploy to the edge clusters. So let's start with scale out architecture. I think most of you know, if not all, that this is a Kubernetes architecture, it's very basic high level, where the control plane has API server and the ETCD as a data store to store all the Kubernetes objects. Then you have a bunch of controllers, such as a services, pod, daemon set, replica set, endpoint, those are controllers running. They all watch API servers to look for something to do. Then you have a scheduler, which is running the scheduling algorithms to decide which part, which containers, or your vacations running on which node. Finally, you have the Kubernetes that run on every and each work node or worker node that actually start and stop your containers, your applications, and manage the life cycle of your applications. So in order for this architecture to support large scale, we split this architecture into two parts. The first part is on the top, I will call a tenant partitions, we call TP. And you receive the request from the customers or tenants. It has your own API server, it has your own ETCD, but the ETCD only store the tenant related information or objects. It run most of the containers, such as your deployment, your replica set, your jobs, your daemon set, or stateful set, and those are information that is stored in the ETCD version of the that partition, so we call it. You see there are two additional controller that with orange color in the diagram. Those are two controllers we added in the Arctos to support a multi-tendency and network isolation. I will uh, talk about this later in the slides. This, the second part, part or partitions on the bottom is what we call the resource partition. It has only API server, it has only ETCD, but it's only running the node and the service account controllers, very small controllers running there. It manage, yeah, it manage the work, the actual computer nodes on behalf of the whole clusters. So it's transparent to the customers. In order for this architecture to work, in fact, the scheduler has token that running on the TP, we call uh, tenant partitions, has to talk to the API server on the RP resource partition just to get a bunch of nodes so that they're doing the schedule needs. Similarly, the Kubernetes running managed by the RP resource partition, he has talked to the API servers on the tenant partition, TP, in order to update the part status, your application, because your application, your part information all stored on the tenant partition on the top. A little bit more design point for this scale out architecture you actually can run multiple TP resource, uh, tenant partitions or multiple RP resource partition, and they scale independently. So it's perfectly fine if you run three TPs, two RPs in this architecture, and it just works. And each tenant belongs to one TP or tenant partitions. A tenant partitions can manage multiple tenants, of course, so it's one to many relationship. Now, if you're running multiple TP or tenant partitions, you will see that you have a multiple scheduler running at the same time because each partition has its own scheduler. 
And those schedule actually will have run concurrently, and you may have a conflict. Fortunately, the Kubernetes scheduler that has its own conflict resolution built in in the uh, schedulers. And of course, if you run multiple RP with resource partitions, the scheduler has to talk to all the RP in order to get all the nodes, or the computer nodes, in order to do a scheduling. So the scheduler, if a multiple scheduler running, they have the whole, uh, have the same information about the nodes. So logically, this is one cluster, not multiple clusters, even though we split the architecture into two. So how good is this scale out architecture? So we're using the uh, community version of Coopmark, which is a benchmark tool, a performance test tool that tests this scale out architecture. So we first try one TP, one RP scale out architecture, which is around one uh, tenant partitions, one resource partitions. As you see, we're able to support 30,000 uh, nodes in the clusters. Compared with community version that we, we also tested a version of 1.21 with 15 case nodes only. As you see from this uh, performance test result, we need mainly focus on the part stop latency. They are very comparable. Where the 99% of uh, percentile, the no stop part is uh, no startup latency, is about 6.5, and it will be higher than compared with uh, 5.6 for the standard Kubernetes version 1.21. Well, but still close. And also, during this scale architecture, we're able to improve the system throughput. You will see that the QPAs were set from default 20 to 120, which is six times our throughput. So with this scale architecture, we're actually able to achieve a double the size of the cluster size to 30,000 nodes with a six times throughput. So this is very encouraging, in fact, promising the scale architecture works for uh, large scale clusters. I mentioned earlier that you can run multiple TP and the multiple RP resource partition or tenant partitions. Now this is an example that has a two TP running and we use an API gateway to distribute the request into the two uh, tenant partitions. And we also have a two RP resource partition that manage each resource partition manages 25,000 nodes. So total in this design, in this sample architecture with two RP is 50,000 uh, computing nodes in the clusters. So with this design, sample scale out architecture, we're also using the same benchmark tool, Kubernetes, to test this two TP, two RP architecture. And you'll see we're able to achieve 50,000 computer nodes in their clusters, compared with, uh, again, Kubernetes version 1.21 with 15K uh, nodes only. And you so if you're looking at the proof of test result, the actual part stop latency is actually much better compared with uh, Kubernetes version 1.21. You will see that 90% uh, higher, 99% higher, the not part stop latency is actually better. So that also with 15,000 uh, computer nodes in the cluster, we're able to deploy and run in 1.5 million containers in this test, which is very promising. So that's the change that we made, the first change we made to scale out the Kubernetes architecture to support a large cluster. Now the second change we made in the Kubernetes for Arctos project is to provide a multi-tendency and a network isolation. So Arctos introduced the concepts called space. And then we arrange all the Kubernetes objects into the space. And the objects in the different space, uh, they don't actually isolate each other, don't talk to each other. There's a special built-in space, we call system space, that where all the system level resources, such as clusters, nodes, those resources are not to do with tenant or customers. They are stored in the system space and it's isolated from the tenant. Then we introduce the tenant object and tenant controllers, as I mentioned earlier in the diagram, that, that control, the, to represent the customers. So every customer, if you use Arctos, you have, we have to create a tenant for you. And tenant has a dedicated space, equal tenant space. 
all the objects created by the attendant, the deployment, the replica set, the jobs, the daemon set, they all created, they were stored in the attendant space and isolated with other space. We also add a field in the metadata for all objects in the uh, Kubernetes uh, called tenant. And that tenant, pro that field actually provides a very nice way to identify which object, which space that this object is belongs to or located to. That way we can easily find out the objects. And that tenant field is also used for authentication authorization. So we're using this field to authenticate that whether you are able to access this resource or not for that tenant. So you provide a access control, it's part of access control to isolate the resource between tenants. So if you really think about this, is each tenant space, you can view tenant space as a virtual cluster. And tenant admin can manage this virtual cluster just that they manage the real Kubernetes cluster. In fact, uh, you can use the tenant admin using the same API to create, uh, for example, the resource quota, the security policy, the config map for your application, for your tenant, and they can still use the same API that created the resource for that tenant, and which is reside in that virtual cluster. That's only visible and available to that tenant. Same thing, same thing is true for CRD, which is customer resource definitions. But now you have a two type of CRDs. You have tenant CRD, the tenant admin created for that uh, virtual class they have. And that CRD, again, is only visible and available to the tenant. Then cluster admin can create a system CRD, which will live in the system space, a uh, system naming space or system space. And that, when you install that and create that, that's available to all tenants. So they provide a nice way for cluster admin to create a common CRDs or objects that are available for all tenants. So that's good. And we provide the tenant, we provide the space a concept to isolate the resources between tenants. How about the network? I think most of you know that knows Kubernetes. The Kubernetes network model is designed to be a flat network. Every part in the cluster can talk to every other parts in the clusters because they're using the single API address space, using the single DNAs. So there's no multi-tenant per se in terms of from network model perspective. But it does provide a network policy for you to control which part can talk to which part for network isolation. But we think this is really soft isolation and it's not enough. So we introduce the network objects and network controllers, which you'll show in the next, uh, in the previously uh, architectural diagrams. So with the network, the tenant, when they create a part, before they create a part, they have to create a sub the network. The network has its own IP address, has its own DNS running. And you can have created multiple uh, networks, which is actually basically is a subnet. And the part within the network, of course, they are living in the same IP address space, they can talk to each other. They are part on the different network. By definition, they cannot talk to each other, which provide a strong isolation for the uh, part communication in the network model. Now for part on the different tenants, of course they are in the different network, so they can not talk to each other by definition. So that also provide another way for isolate, isolation uh, for between the tenants. So now the third change we made or introduced in Octus is to unify the API and the runtime to support both VM and containers in the same platform. Basically, there are two approaches to support VMs in Kubernetes. We talk about the second approach, which we call native approach. The first approach is add-on approach, where you define a separate CRDs, you define or implement a separate operators or controllers, and therefore, you have a separate APIs for VMs than for containers. Now, the second approach we take, we're using exactly the same API, we extend it, we're using all existing controllers and the existing schedulers without any change. So in order for that to work, we first introduce virtual machine type 
in the part definition, as you see in this diagram. Now the part not only represent the containers, but also represent the virtual machines. So it's very nice abstraction that already defined in the Kubernetes for part. We just use and leverage the part definitions. Now in the future, we intend to support other type of resources. Could be bare metals, could be other uh, type of resource con uh, containers. So with that part definition extension, now all the controllers, including the deployment controllers, the replica set, the jobs, again, the services, the endpoint now works for VMs. And VM, we call VM part. Now it works for VMs. And there's nothing, there's no need to change on the controllers to support that, to support the VMs. So everything is the same. There is a small minor change in scheduler based on the current implementation of scheduler of Kubernetes. And you're actually looking for containers. So we change that to abstract that uh, so that they recognize the part instead of recognize the containers. Now they can recognize containers and uh, virtual machines. So that is a minor change. But the main change to support the unified platform for the VM and containers is the runtime infrastructure. As you know, this is a runtime architecture on the node for Kubernetes. And to we extend this runtime infrastructure to support the VMs by extending the CRI, the, con the container runtime interface, with this VM specific properties, as you see in this diagrams. Then we add a VM runtime, which is a modification of wallet that will register this runtime to the runtime registry in the Kubernetes. And we also introduce the part converters on the left, right side of the diagrams that convert the part specification to the format that VM runtime recognize. So with that, we are able to end to end from API server to actually uh, start managing VMs and all the way to the uh, actual host, actual node, with the runtime to start the VM instance. So lastly, we introduce a object called actions on the VM part. There are certain set of actions that can be performed on the VM that's not applied to the containers, such as you can stop or stop a, a virtual machine. You can reboot your virtual machine. You can take a snapshot of virtual machines, detect or detach or attach the device from your virtual machine. Those are specific actions for your VMs. So we introduce these action objects that in the architectures to support that. We also extend the Kubernetes that, that listen to the actions from API servers. And for example, if you say, I want to reboot your VMs, you use an API YAML files to create the action objects or actions request. And the, the Kubernetes on the host, which actually listen to the actions and then get it, and then we reboot your uh, actual, do the performance actions and the, uh, to reboot your VMs. So by now, I have talked about uh, three major change uh, in Kubernetes for the architectures. And this is all core fundamental change. The first change we made to, is to extend this architecture to support edge clusters. And Pong Du from our team will talk about that. And so with that, um, I cannot give uh, our view of deep dive of the architectures project. Again, the project's open source project and if you're interested, you can, find, you can go to Centaurus website or the uh, GitHub link we will provide in the end of this talk and get more information from there. So right now, I will hand off my uh, to our Dupo and he can talk about the MISA and the architecture on the edge cluster side. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Xing. Uh, let me forward. So hi, uh, my name is Peng Du, and today I'm here to introduce the, uh, to talk about the Miser and the Edge project. Uh, since this is a tutorial and we have limited time, I will not go too f much further into the details, but I want you guys to walk away with um, essentially uh, why we're doing this project and what's the benefit that the way we're doing it. 
And if you have further questions, there will be more information uh, provided. So I'll start with Mizar and Dr. Xiong and Meng already discussed this uh, uh, a little bit. So the connection between this Mizar and the other part of this whole Centaurus effort is you can think, one way to think about that is the uh, multi-tenancy. Now, uh, for example, if we have one cluster, we have different tenant, then we, use, we provide the multi-tenancy so each user thinks that they own the cluster, they can do uh, whatever they want based on uh, their, uh, well, of course, there's limitation, but they think they own the cluster. For Mizar is to control the network side of this, okay? And uh, there are very uh, there are different uh, benefits of uh, having this Mizar architecture. So scalability, as we said, we want to support a very large number of endpoints. Here, if you see the, the word, oh, actually, I want to take this off. Here, if you see the word endpoints, uh, you can think of that as just a pod, or uh, we provide other kind of VMs and pods, but uh, the uh, endpoint here uh, for a mental image, you can think of that as just a pod. Of course, we want to provide a higher performance and throughput with high, high throughput and low latency, and uh, extensibility. This is important, especially for a uh, single cluster and for the edge. And I will talk about this more uh, in a little bit. And the versatility is we want to support a VM, we want to support pod. So the, 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 for the Mesa project, it, it's able to support that. With these four points, I feel like it's a little abstract. So uh, again, uh, think of Mesa as we, want, we have multi-tenancy in a cluster. And uh, uh, then if you convert that multi-tenancy concept into the network, uh, is the Mesa network uh, models we want to see. So I want to start with this so that you have a better idea of what we are talking about. So we, we said we can support multi-tenancy. Here I'm showing you two tenants, so one tenant one and tenant two. From the VPC address space, you can see that they actually have the same address space so that they cannot, they're not supposed to talk to each other, but inside each VPC uh, range. If you have pods within there, they can talk to each other with that IP address. Actually, if you have a pod in VPC one, they can have the same IP address within that range in the in the other tenant space, but they cannot talk to each other. So the VP, the, the point here is the VPC uh, is a virtualized network. So by that I mean they are um, uh, they can be duplicated and uh, they don't talk to each other. Uh, uh, yeah, and also uh, if we dive into one single VPC, we see that um, within that uh, uh, IP range, we can s further divide it that into smaller range, which we call subnet. A subnet, as you can see here on the left, that's the first subnet. Uh, uh, by showing all those red zero, you know that the IP range for that is 192.168.0 something. And on the right is a second subnet, and it start with a different uh, uh, IP range. It's 122 and some. So this is within one VPC, and keep in mind one VPC is for one tenant. So for each tenant, they can pick, okay, if based on w what they are trying to do. They can say, I have one subnet for, for a certain kind of work, the other subnet for the other kind of work, and they can pick and choose where to put them. This is more important also when we talk about the edge, because now this is still, uh, it used to be just for one cluster. And when we talk about the edge, things are more distributed and the subnet can be distributed as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, with the, the concept of VPC and subnets, uh, if we are talking about uh, we want to put things together, for one cluster, we can have one VPC as shown here. And we have two subnets and we can have endpoints. By here, uh, we can see that the endpoint, we, have, we, we simply just have two pods and they have their IP. Just pay some attention to the, the IP range. So uh, the pod on the left belong to the first subnet, the pod on the right belong to the second subnet. And uh, essentially all we want to do is so they can talk to each other through the VPC IPs or through the IP uh, that's allocated from that VPC IP range. As simple as that. So this is the, like the logical model that we're trying to achieve. Uh, with this model, now we can talk about how we implement this and what's the benefit we get from, from our implementation. Um, since we're still talking about the one cluster, we have, 
uh, this is a typical uh, Kubernetes cluster. Here it is showing as Actos cluster. We have the master, we have the, the worker uh, nodes. So these are, I'm showing like a very, very um, abstract uh, components. I'm not, I'm not showing all the details, but for the master, it has the control plan. That's the, uh, if you will, the, the Kubernetes control plan with the scheduler, controllers, and all that. With the worker node, the, the, one of the most important part is the kubelet, right? So based on this, then uh, we want to run or we want to install Mesa on this. And Mesa by itself, it, uh, it brings in a few extra components to support that VPC and subnet. So one is the control plan. The control plan is running as CRDs and controllers. It essentially just manage all the objects. For example, we talk about the, the VPC, we talk about the subnet. Those are the, uh, when we talk about the implementation, those are the objects stored in ETCD. So, uh, uh, and also there's a workflow going through them. For example, if you create a subnet, what's gonna happen? If you create a, a, another VPC, a lot of things needs to happen. That's why we have the controllers there to work with that. Um, on the worker node, uh, there are two parts. One is, uh, let me show just one. So on the worker node, first thing is the Mesa agent. Uh, what it does is essentially taking control command from the control plan, and it's in charge of um, making modification to or just put that, turn that command into some action on this uh, Mesa XDP uh, programs. So we run Mesa XDP program on each node uh, that's going to be the real control of where the network packet goes. And uh, we run all this in all the worker nodes, sometimes in the uh, clusters, in the master as well, if we use that as the worker node. But those are the three biggest components uh, coming from the Mesa. If you have a cluster, you want to install uh, Mesa, those are things that uh, you will install there. Okay. And uh, the XDP program, I'll uh, spend a little bit of time. Uh, actually, the quick pause, who, uh, who has experience with XDP program? Who has heard of this XDP program? Okay, then I'll go into a little bit uh, further details here. So here, uh, what it shows per node. So if we go back to this picture, I'm showing all the components. We have a bunch of nodes there. If you just look into one of the worker nodes, this is what it looks like. So you should still recognize we have the Mesa agent and we have the XDP programs. Um, those two green box, you see we, we actually run two XDP programs. And if you're not familiar with what that is, that's, think of that as you're running your code in a kernel where the kernel provides a virtual machine, a sort of a, a virtual machine. It's not the kind you get from EC2, for example, but it provides a virtualized environment in the Linux kernel where you can put your program in there. Here, we are putting the uh, Transic XDP program in there. So we put it in there, it can run, and of course, it has to, it has to go through a bunch of safety checks. It cannot just run some random things in the kernel, of course. But after that, you put your code inside that uh, virtual machine, and that will see all the traffic packet coming in and going out. So that, pack, that the traffic will come from the pod. So for example, here I'm showing the ingress. Ingress means we have some packet coming in from the cloud or from somewhere else. It arrives at the uh, network interface. And uh, the first thing the packet goes to is not that the network stack anymore. It's intercepted by this XDP program. It sees that it has the business, uh, business it has uh, the business logic in it. So it sees this, it's the, essentially that's the implementation of the, 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 of the VPC and subnet. And uh, we have the logic that this is for the uh, ingress part. So packet coming in, based on where you're going, where the packet is trying to go. Sometimes it's targeted as a pod on this host. Sometimes it needs to be uh, sent to some other host. So first case is, well, uh, the XTP program will see, oh, uh, the target is the pod on this host, as simple as that. So the, the uh, XTP program will do some processing and then essentially pass that to the network stack. From that on, it's the same as before. Like we, it goes through all the layers and eventually that packet will uh, go to that pod and pod will receive that message, okay? In another case, the XTP program will see that, oh, it's uh, actually it come here for the, 
for a reason, but that the reason is not to go to a part that belongs to this host. It's, it's supposed to go somewhere else. Then in that case, the XDP program will not even bother that the network stack. It will just simply send that or divert that back out with some changes to, okay, you are trying to talk to me. At this point, you need to talk to some other node. So it will change the source destination based on who is trying to talk, and it will send it back out to the interface. What's the benefit of this? Well, you are not going through the network stack anymore. That takes time. That takes a lot of compute. Here, we take the packet the first time it shows up on this node. We do the processing, and we send it out. So that's much faster and more efficient than having to go through the stack all the way up and then having to go through the stack all the way back down. Okay? So th that's the two cases where uh, uh, things can happen for the ingress, the packet coming in. Another way, of course, is if we are sending something from the pod, the pod is trying to talk to another pod based on their VPC IP or subnet IP, uh, or their, their IP in their subnet. It's happening very similar. So the, another XDP program will intercept that, will, will seize that, and uh, it, will be, it will just make some decision, and it can send that to the interface, and the packet will just go out. Okay, as you can see, the, the process is very similar. It's coming in, going out. They are going through the XDP program. We try to avoid that, that the network stack as much as possible. Well, if we have to go in there, then we have to go in there. Uh, there's also the eBPF map, but that's the data that determines where the packet is supposed to go. If it's supposed to go to uh, another uh, pod here or some other pod on some other node, that all those information will be stored in that eBPF maps. Think of that as a dictionary you put here, a hash table or whatever you want to call it. And where does that data come from? That data come from that uh, means our agent that's running on this node. So that puts everything together. And if I just back out one uh, a few more slides. That's what's running on one of the, those worker nodes. Okay, I hope that's uh, helpful. All right. Um, further on, just more details as how we do the the device. Uh, back then, we talked about the packet coming in. It has to go here. It has to go there. But the, those decisions are based on the VPC and subnet logic and how we implement that. Here is a quick uh, uh, illustration. So for example, we have two pods on the left. Sometimes the pod one wants to talk to pod two on the same side in the same subnet. In that case, it goes to one of the uh, bouncer node. Bouncer is just a host running that XDP program we just talked about. So it has those logic in it. So it knows that when the packet coming into the bouncer, it will be bouncing back to the, the other pod, the other host in the same subnet. Similarly, uh, if we are talking to the pod in the right, which is in a different subnet, but in the same VPC, then the bouncer essentially says, oh, uh, you are going out. You, you are not under my management. So it's sending that to uh, another thing called divider. Divider is just another host running the XDP program, but it controls different part of the communication. It can see, oh, I'm going to supposed to send that to another bouncer, which uh, manages the other subnet. Think of this as you are sending a message to a guy in a different building. You don't know where he is. You know his office number, but you cannot find that building. So you send that to the front desk. The front desk send that to, for example, the post office. The post office send it to the other front desk in the other building, and that front desk has the information of where that guy is. Think of it that way, and it will make more sense there. Okay. And this is uh, roughly how Mesar works. Uh, uh, there's more information there. Uh, the introduction here is uh, just to have you guys understand why we're doing this and what's the basic components in there. Uh, I'll continue with the Edge project. Um, I'm, I'm under limited time, so I'll go a little faster. But uh, so here are the goals and the visions of the edge computing. Actually, edge computing means different things to different people. It's a very broad uh, term. So, uh, so I want to uh, just give you guys a, a moment to think about, OK, what do you think of the goals of, for edge computing? Uh, through our research and development, that we came up some of the key or important things we think edge computing environment should have. And this is the problem we are trying to address with our solutions. 
On the right, I'm showing a simple edge computing example, I guess with the story, it's easier to remember. But think of it as we have some server running in the cloud, or we have some server running off the cloud or in some local environment, and we have some device running on it. I'm showing camera, but it doesn't have to be a camera. It could be a sensor, it could be your phone, it could be all those things. So uh, based on what the criteria on the left, uh, on the right, we have all this, but uh, if we want to solve those problems, there's a problem with the ar architecture you're showing, you're seeing on the right. For one, with the scalability we're seeing, especially with 5G, uh, there's going to be more and more devices trying to connect to the cloud. And if we, we want to support that scalability, uh, that uh, cloud point will become a bottleneck, right? Um, so instead, we, we come up with this hierarchy. We think the uh, framework that supports edge computing should be a hierarchical. It's like a, it's like a tree with different branches. Uh, can I go for another two, five, two, two, uh, another five minutes? Okay, thank you. Okay, so compare this with this. You can see the difference. And what that difference provides is the scalability. Now you see that all the sensors, all the local devices, they're not talking to one single server across the whole region. It's trying to, for example, talking to uh, a server in that, that's really uh, uh, close to all those devices. By doing that, you have better latency, right? You're talking to someone who's closer to you and who can give you the answer faster. And also, if you have, uh, if you have multiple uh, servers that's dealing with all these local uh, per, uh, devices, then you can scale this. Think of Actos as we're trying to support more nodes, more devices, more compute in one cluster. Think of this as we're uh, uh, horizontally scaled, scaling this out to different clusters. Um, so that's another way to scale out, well, scale up or scale out, okay? Uh, a few other things I want to go quickly go over. Uh, for example, the autonomy. The one key goal for the edge computing and the one key difference is uh, things can fail if you put that outside a data center. In a data center, you have cooling, you have all the staff there. Outside data center, you don't have, sometimes you don't even have access to that the device very easily. So being able to deal with failures, whether that's the network failure or the single node failure, we want to be able to deal with that. And the application running on the edge should be able to continue to run. Uh, one last thing is that the privacy means sometimes the user don't want to send their data to the cloud. So we, we do the processing closer to the user, as close as possible. And we send only the, the, uh, the produce or process result upward. And we, if we have different layer of this, we can continue down this path. Okay, okay. So I'll go a little quicker. Uh, we have a different ways of organizing this cluster. Here's a question. The answer to this real quick is uh, we want to support both cases. Uh, this is the decision made by the user. We want to be flexible. We provide a solution. The user can make their choice. Okay. Uh, these are some uh, details architecture. On the left is uh, some detailed components. I will not go into there, but uh, if you take this and we are able to expand that so that we can support those hierarchical clusters. And uh, of course, if you have workload distributed everywhere, then there's a ways to essentially say, I have a deployment, I have a pod, I need to run that at a certain cluster at a certain level, then we're able to, to provide that uh, facility so that you can do that. The last thing I want to talk about is networking. Here, we, we saw this before, this is one, for one cluster. Now we are expanding that to two clusters with two subnets spreading out. They're not in the same cluster anymore, but uh, we still want to be able to support that. In, the, in our edge solution, we do have that. And the way we do it, I'll go with it real quick. We provide now uh, another l a level of gateway communication between those clusters. So this is not one single point of uh, uh, control, they are distributed, so that's also met the goal of scalability. And if we have two pods there, they can talk to each other like that. So, okay. Um, uh, for more details, we just have had our first release, so if you want more details, uh, feel free to talk to me afterward, or uh, there has our information. Sorry about the running over time. Thank you.
thanks uh, Peng, Dr. Shong and Mengni for giving the overview of Centorius and uh, thanks to everyone who have joined in person even in COVID uh, pandemic. So uh, as we all know that uh, we are in open source and uh, it cannot work without a community and the supporters like uh, you all. Uh, this like I'll just give a quick background about what the Centorius like we already know about this project, a technical concept but how it actually started and what are the key partners that has been involved uh, with this community uh, and what is our goal uh, so far where we have been and what we want to achieve and without your support it, it again will not be possible. So uh, as, as uh, we discussed like Centorius just launched uh, in Linux Foundation officially in des on December 16, 2020, it's still a small baby but uh, we are still like growing that and with the support of the great partners like Futureway, uh, uh, Click to Cloud, Great Gain, um, Soda Foundation, Informatics and a few others. So uh, the partners got involved to discuss the strategy of course with the, uh, with the great community members and industry experts. As we all know that there is a huge demand in, in industry uh, when we talk about uh, the edge or even the growing number of IoT devices that we use on daily basis at the same time uh, the, the medical in the industry, healthcare or even a smart city like uh, the devices or cameras that are, uh, that are based around the places and it required uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanism to manage and to process the data. We found that there is still a huge requirement in the in industry at the same time there is a gap which needs to be fixed. And that is how the Centorius comes into the picture, um, where we are trying to uh, make sure that how we can make that distributed cloud at the same time, uh, provide a multi-tenancy, uh, scale this, uh, the, like, uh, the architecture or the nodes at 30K, even in future with the mole, uh, uh, multiple numbers or thousands uh, nodes. So our entire strategy comes into the picture that how we can make that possible. We, we form a community uh, with, uh, with, with the voting system or uh, with the support of a different industry and leadership. We got an advisory uh, committee, uh, which is part of Dr. Shong, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Hakim and uh, Chris from CNCF, uh, where they are part of, on the advisory and then uh, defining the technical or industry uh, requirement um, even the strategic guidelines that how this community should look like. Uh, then we got like entire technical steering committee of member of seven members elected by again a community and industry uh, where, like Deepak, Prashant, uh, uh, Stephen, Sunil, Shaoning, um, and Nikita. Uh, so we all are, the, I mean this all technical uh, steering committees there who meets every single month to define the project. To, to make sure that what are the missing parts or even to add a new projects uh, like approving the, uh, approving the guidelines uh, and making sure that we are meeting the industry expectations that is going to come uh, in the upcoming quarter or even in the current phase. Uh, with that, we got like outreach and marketing committee, which part of Annie, and she's not here today, but uh, she's also there. And myself, where we are plan, and we are like taking care of the marketing partnership. Without that, which 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 is the core part, uh, along with the technical capability. So that is how our committee looks like. Uh, and again, uh, along with this committee, we have a special interest group like. Uh, SIGs for each of the modules that Dr. Shang Mengni and uh, Peng have just introduced, like Actros, Mizar, uh, the Edge and AI side. And whenever we define this project, since it's open source, we all we want you to be part of this uh, community, even this project, and start developing or even giving the suggestions. So this all SIG groups are open source. Uh, I mean, the meetings uh, which we conduct on a weekly basis is open source. You are more than happy to participate and give the suggestions or a recommendation. Even if you want to suggest any project that you think is relevant, that is where we normally discuss and communicate in this forum. So we have four different uh, groups. Then uh, recently, as I mentioned that since this uh, community is, uh, I mean, a project is still so young, but we we got, uh, uh, we recently hosted an event in Asia, uh, 
in APAC region um, last month where we got a great response from uh, about 12 different countries. Uh, like a lot of speakers joined, our industry experts joined from uh, China, from uh, India, from France, from, um, from the different regions. And they were part of the keynotes. We, we successfully launched this event um, where the traction of that Centaurus project went to 50,000 outreach uh, on the social media channels. Around 1,300 uh, like 10, uh, people registered for that event. Uh, 200 colleges in Asia Pacific showed interest to get that community project in their uh, curriculum activity. Um, around 700 plus people joined live uh, during that event. Uh, we got 40 members uh, been part of, out of uh, that event and then who might be a core community members even in future or can be a core contributor uh, during uh, in this Centaurus project. We, we announced seven uh, like top awards uh, along with the cash prizes and 33, cert 33 certificates been sponsored by um, our partner, I mean, Click to Cloud. So this is a, a public release and uh, announcement that has been published on so, uh, the local and regional newspapers uh, are, are the gifts that we have uh, announced or uh, uh, distributed as well as uh, the, the vision to make this project to the industry like telecom, to healthcare, and so on. So that is how that vision has been recognized by Government of India as well, which has been published on, uh, on the uh, announcement that you can see on right. So with that, uh, I'm sure that you uh, must be uh, might be interested to know more that how you can join this community and how you can start contributing or being part of this uh, our ecosystem. So uh, you're more than uh, welcome to, to join. Uh, we have our booth uh, entire four days in this, uh, in this event. Um, our team is there. You can feel free to reach out and then uh, talk about the ideas that you have or even the, uh, the feedback in, in case you think or want to learn more about that. Uh, with that, you can reach, uh, go to our website and know more about the Centaurus. Uh, we have our mailing group, subscribe that mailing group so you can get new announcement and the latest updates that we have recent, I mean, released so far. Uh, we have our GitHub accounts where you can uh, fork the code, try out and uh, like do some kind of activities around it and feel free to share us the feedback. Um, we saw that we, I mean, even in that small duration, there is thousand lines of code that has been updated uh, in past couple of months from the community contributors like, uh, like you all. So we welcome all of you to join our uh, group. Uh, also the Slack for any uh, offline communication, we have different uh, Slack channels for each of this project. And with that, meeting information can be also available over there. So I, with that, I would, I'll just let the time uh, give back to you to enjoy your lunch. And thank you so much for being part of Centaurus, and we welcome you all to, to, to grow this community even more further. Thank you.